Welcome to the Curious About Nature podcast. I'm delighted today that I'm joined by Tessa Cobley from Ladybird Plant Care, who's going to be introducing us to natural pest control. Hello, Tessa. Re- really delighted that you've joined us. We've got a fairly big back garden, and I must admit that I'm not a, a natural gardener. But I have in the past had like allotments and I do love growing vegetables and cut flowers. So I'm really fascinated by this topic today. Could you tell us a little bit about your background? Yeah, so I used to work in digital marketing and I worked in lots of different agencies for lots of different clients, including Ford Motor Company and Sony and Paid Organic Baby Food. And then I had my own children. So I had twins and going back to commuting London to Brighton four or five days a week in the old days where you had to actually go to the office was not going to really work anymore. I bought Ladybird Plant Care at the end of 2018. So the first year was really learning at breakneck speed. And then the last few years have been no growth and getting the word out there about biologicals and helping people to understand them, use them, use them successfully. And yeah, just finding out more about people's pest problems and helping them to fix them. So what made you buy into a company then that does natural pest control? It's fascinating. I don't think I was too daunted about buying into something that, or buying something that I hadn't had much experience of before, just because in previous roles I've always had to get up to speed very quickly on things. And the nature of what I did was to live and breathe the brand that I was working on, so... I live and breathe the brand that is mine now, which is fantastic. And that's amazing. I really admire that. And just that whole kind of immersing yourself and learning about your subject is absolutely brilliant. So have you got any favourite experiences or maybe facts about insects, pests that you want to share? My all-time favourite fact is probably that daddy long legs is a crane fly, which in the garden are a pest called leather jacket. So they're young as leather jacket and lives in the lawn and eat your lawn which is often where people find that they have no lawn left, especially if you live in a new build or you've just had a new turf. But the crane fly, the daddy long legs themselves, live for less than a day and they don't even have a mouth. Wow. They yeah, that's amazing. Born, <laughs> mate, lay eggs, die, all in a day. Yeah, that is an amazing lifespan, isn't it? To yeah. fit that all in. <laughs> often you feel bad that they've got trapped indoors, especially if you're camping. You feel bad that they've got trapped in your tent and maybe died, but they didn't have very long anyway, so it's fine. <laughs> Have you got any tips for first-time gardeners or families like myself that want to use natural pest control? I would say be really vigilant. Be very mindful of what you've got, what pests are most susceptible to and those plants that you're growing and what you've got in your garden. Keep a real close eye on underneath the leaves, damage to leaves. When you're digging and moving things, if there's any grubs in the soil, identify those because the quicker that you act on something, the more that the control that you use will work. And for something really common like slugs or vine weevil, which is also very common, the first couple of treatments of the season are absolutely key along with the last couple of treatments of the season, they're really key as well. If you want to do really well the following season, that's the best time to reduce pest numbers for the following year because all of those pests will overwinter in your garden, your greenhouse, conservatory, and come back stronger the following year if you don't break the life cycle. I think that's what I did wrong with my allotment when I had it. I always used to run out of energy. And it's difficult, isn't it, if you've got a family to find the time to do things. But I think if you're really passionate and you want it to work, it's such a lovely way to relax and get outside and be involved in what's going on in your backyard. and all really enthusiastic when you open the packet of seeds and when you put them in the hole and then that's it, really. And apart from the wanting to drown them every day. <laughs> <laughs> T- tell me a little bit more about that then. Oh, the, I just uh, love watering. Yeah. They are absolutely obsessed with water. I swear that they're half water baby, half child. But they'll happily play with water flowers. So watering plants is brilliant. But you have to, no, stop. That's enough water for that. You drown. You can drown plants. If I do have a, a slug problem, what's the best sort of solution for that then? So there's a tiny microscopic eel worm, mm. a nematode, that is specifically targeted to slugs. It's also a natural predator of snails, but because it works under the ground, the snails will tend to avoid the area that's been treated with nanoslug because 
it is their natural predators and they're not stupid they will try and avoid it so you will find that areas that you've consistently treated they will avoid but the idea with the nematodes is the nematodes enter the slug and then they emit a, a chemical and that liquidizes the insides of the slug and they then use that to reproduce so they're using the slug as like a nursery for their young and then more nematodes get released into the soil and they are naturally occurring all of the natural predators that I sell are naturally occurring in the UK. So you're not introducing something that's invasive or not okay for the natural environment. They're all safe for pets and other wildlife and kids, adults, they're all safe. So yeah, it's unlikely that a, a slug that's been affected by an nematode is going to be hanging around on the surface. But if a bird or a hedgehog was to eat it, it would cause no harm. So they reduce the slug population, which is why I said it's really good to treat at the beginning of the season. Because that's when you've got the baby slugs hatching out. So if you get them early, and what we're finding is more and more people are using it, and more and more people are talking about it, is that people are like, I can't actually believe that this is my same garden. I've got hardly any slugs, and I've got plants coming up that I haven't seen for years because they just don't make it out of the ground because the slugs get them. And 90% of the slugs live underneath the surface. So that even when you think your garden is full of slugs, that is just the tip of the iceberg. So the idea with nematodes is to control the population. The first time you do it, it's a bit like, oh my God, this is complicated and it's going to take me hours. But actually, once you get into it, it's really simple. And it's not like old school pellets or anything like any barrier methods that in involve sprinkling or putting you can't let them dry out but you don't have to worry when it rains and then your salt and your eggshells are gone you do it again in six weeks and you do it again all season until the soil temperature drops below what you're really trying to do is by introducing those lovely yummy plants into your garden you're actually boosting the population of the pests so by introducing biological controls you're just evening it back out again so you're boosting the population of their predator which is in short supply, and that's the whole idea of biology. Yeah, so it's a balance, isn't it? Yeah. And, yeah. yeah, and you're totally imbalancing it by <laughs> growing all that yummy stuff in your garden. I think it's fascinating. Interestingly, I was talking to my illustrator, Grace, and we were talking about natural pest control. And she said, oh, I've just bought something from Ladybird Plant Care. And I was like, oh, that's amazing, because she didn't know we were going to have you on. So there are 24-year-olds who are really getting into this. And I think that's really brilliant that there's a younger generation that have really thinking through how they look after their plants. But I'm going to check in with Grace end of this week to see how she's getting on with hers. But yeah. yeah, what problem did she have? Well, she bought, I think it was nematodes. Yeah, yeah. Yes, she'd probably got fungus nets. Yeah, she felt a bit guilty because she'd moved into a house and brought the problem with her, I think. <laughs> Part of the reason we're seeing it, especially people that grow seedlings for outside, getting them. And it's because we're using better compost with more organic matter in it and less chemically treated, more natural compost is always going to come with its own problems because it's not been treated to get rid of those. Yeah. Yeah. So we've talked a little bit about slugs and other pest control. Any tips for controlling it? It's, there's loads of things to control. Aphids have been a problem in food production for a number of years. So big commercial food production where they're growing in big glass houses. Aphids have always been a huge problem and their damage is fast and they reproduce really fast. So they're born pregnant, which is problematic, and they can go on to have three babies a day. They deform leaves. So there's a really quick answer is a horticultural soap that now. So to always have that, because if you spray that every day, you will reduce the numbers. And then the natural predators, there's two different types of predator. There's the ones that eat aphids, and then there's the ones that kill aphids to use them as nurseries for their own young. So the parasitic wasps will lay an egg inside the aphid, egg will hatch and then it hatches out obviously that kills the aphid they're really effective and then there's lacewing larvae ladybird larvae and aphilites who all feed on aphids yeah there's lots of choices with aphids but it's again a bit about being really vigilant because an aphid problem can get out of hand really fast it literally it'll take a day and there'll be no aphids to loads of aphids in one day yeah yeah it's amazing isn't it how nature can quickly reproduce 
So you touched on this already a little bit, but what are the advantages and maybe possibly disadvantages of using biological controls? So biological controls are completely safe. Mm. They're, they're great because you don't want to use nasty chemicals in your garden. You don't want to harm other wildlife. For example, the horticultural soap and the other organic approved spray that I sell, they're contact-based insecticides. So they will kill the insect on contact, but only kill the insect that you spray it on. Whereas the other sprays, they offer protection. If anything offers protection, you've got to be worried because they're leaving behind a poison so that the next insect that comes along is affected by that poison. And you can't dictate which insect is going to be the next one that comes along. It's either a pest or it could be something that you wouldn't want to harm for other wildlife. And they are really effective and they are quite often less labour intensive than other methods because... You put them in and they do their job. On the disadvantage side, they're more expensive, but having just been chatting to someone who used to use the multi blue slug pellets, it works out the same price because you would have to do those weekly and after rain, so you'd have to buy quite a lot, whereas you only do the nematodes every six weeks. So actually, it works out quite similar. But yeah, they are a bit more expensive. And then the other thing is that they're a live creature. They, I don't have a training academy for them. They just get released into the wild and they don't know how bad the problem is. So some people will be disappointed that they haven't eradicated the pest, but there just may have been way more food than they had an appetite for. So introducing them early is good. Knocking down the numbers of the pests before you introduce the predators with the horticultural soap, all those things. But yeah, I think... People need to understand that it's a control. On most cases, it's not an eradication. Yeah. It's working with nature and nature changes. And then the other thing that some people find a disadvantage is that I can't always send stuff out the day that people order it mm. because it's a live product. It's not held in stock. So the yeah. stock gets ordered according to what people have ordered so that it's alive when it gets to people. If I was wanting to get started on this with my family, what would you recommend would be a good way to introduce children to natural pets? My children describe it, they're four and a half, they describe it as the good bugs that eat the bad bugs because the bad bugs eat our plants. I use that with adults as well, to be honest. That's the most simple explanation. I don't sell anything that for insects that don't eat plants. I'm not interested in controlling the number of wasps in your garden, the number of house flies in your house. That's not what we're here for. We're here to help you be more successful in your growing. Yeah. So it's only for bugs that eat plants. So have you any sort of nature or gardening activities that you would recommend for families? Just growing. And I yeah. think it's quite interesting. Like I say we're growing sunflowers. I'm growing some. <laughs> that sounds about right. I dropped some off at nursery and they got aphids and that was interesting. Look at these insects and look what's happened to those leaves because the insects have eaten all the juice of the leaf. Yeah, I think just growing things from seed they find fascinating. In fact, they don't eat green things because they're four and a half, but they grew cress in an egg cup. So they ate egg and cress sandwich because they've grown the cress themselves. Growing things that flower... And growing things that you can eat, they're massively into. Yeah, yeah, I completely agree with you. We bought my daughter an apple tree that she has to tend. It's one of these patio pot ones. Oh, yeah. And every year, we should get apples this year from it. And she's so excited by the idea that finally her apple tree is going to give her a crop of apples. Yeah, I think the growing bit is the bit that they find more interesting. Yeah. Yeah, my daughter's thing is that she doesn't like getting soil on her hands. So we saw saying, where are the gloves that you've got? I don't want to wear the gloves. They feel uncomfortable. And it's, no, uh, the gloves do feel uncomfortable. Yeah. So I, I, we need to find a brand that is is comfortable but protective, I think, for her. Then maybe she'll be a bit more willing to give a hand. Yeah. But at the moment, it's, oh, yeah, I'll put the seeds in. There you go. Pat it down. That's as much as I'm doing now, literally. <laughs> But she'll quite happily play in the garden. But the idea of actually having to dig and put your hands in the soil, I don't know, mummy and daddy can do that. So are there any books or resources that you would recommend for families maybe to support their own gardening activities? I think it really depends on what stage you're at and what you like to grow. There's so many good books. There's some excellent new houseplant books out. It's really great. What I've found is where people have been awesome on Instagram at 
educating and they've got real engagement they've then gone on to get book deals and their books are much more modern than the traditional big company too i think it's a great activity to go and have a browse at the bookshop and see what's most like the way that you garden because it's not going to be useful to you unless it fits with a what you're growing and b how you organize your gardening like whether you do it in a short amount of time or is it something you spend loads of time on so I think it has to suit your mood yeah yeah I think that's really good advice so we've got probably at least 20 gardening books some of them that have only been half looked at and the one that I keep coming back to is a sort of seasonal planner so it's about growing something every day to put something on your plate and that kind of appeals to me rather than the RHS gardening which is brilliant Mm -hmm. But is quite impenetrable if you're not. Books tend to be quite heavy on the pesticide side yeah. of things. They do tend to not encourage, but they give quite a lot of present prominence to chemical controls, which I think will go away. It's just because that's the way it was always done. So, have you any thoughts about how we can encourage children's connection with nature? I know that your daughter doesn't like it, but I think it's just getting your hands. <laughs> I completely agree with you. <laughs> she can just look, even if you're in the car. It can be like, oh, look at that yellow plant. Do you know what that is growing? That sort of thing where you could just be going, oh, look at this and look at that and seeing you can find animals. And I find there's loads of ladybirds in play parks. You just have to look and they're there. Lots of bugs to look at. Yeah, so I think it's just being a bit more chatty about what you're seeing. Yeah, actually stop and smell the roses, isn't it? Almost, yeah. So what actions are your family taking at the moment to connect with nature? We've got sunflowers. We've recently moved house, so we have more of a garden and the kids go to a nursery who take them out of the nursery every day and go for walks so they do quite a lot of spotting things in nature and yeah they're just getting involved really and I guess with the business they don't see everything but they see lots of things they know that there's nematodes in the fridge and that when I'm working that's what they know what I'm working on how much of it they really understand I have no idea yeah they yesterday I made a reel for Instagram with someone that supplies me and and I've worked with before that makes the 100% copper slug rings and I needed someone to throw me a slug ring so my little girl like throwing me like at me (laughs) so they're getting involved in the marketing as well I'm hoping at some point they just start taking over great I was going to ask you what's next for Ladybird Plant Care. And it sounds like to me that the potential there for a family run business long term. (laughs) It's just growing the business, growing the awareness, working with other people to spread the word of not reaching for the bug spray. So if I was interested in a natural pest control, where would I find Ladybird Plant Care? So the website is ladybirdplantcare.co.uk. And on the website, you'll find all the products, but you'll also find articles on different types of plant problems, pest problems. But there's also detailed information about all the different pests and help to diagnose different pest problems. But I'm also available on email via the website or plantcare at ladybirdplantcare.co.uk. If people are like, I have no idea. I just don't know what this is. They can email me photographs and explanations and we can try and work it out. And then on Instagram, it's at ladybirdplantcare. And there's loads and loads of short form help and advice and conversation about the most common pests and how to deal with them and success stories and tips about using the product. But yeah, those are the two main places, really, the website and email and then Instagram. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Tessa, for joining me today. That's really incentivised me to be a little bit more proactive about pest control this year, definitely. Vigilance is key. Yes. Yeah. yeah, so uh, learned a lot this morning. So thank you so much for joining us. That's okay, thank you.